Now let's take a look at what's happening in our community, brought to you by the expert injury attorneys at Todd Minor Law. Presented by Edition Financial Credit Union. Count us in. Thank you for joining us, everyone. I'm Tammy Fields. Greg is on assignment. Here are your top stories in weather in 90 seconds. Nearly a year after 14-year-old Tyree Sampson fell to his death from the Orlando free fall, attorneys for Sampson's family reached a settlement with the ride operator in Icon Park. Crews are almost done removing the ride from the park. An elementary school teacher is accused of inappropriate conduct with a minor and trying to obtain child pornography. Ocala police say this man, Eddie Scott, made advances toward his ex-girlfriend's child. Police say he teaches at Wyoming Park Elementary School. More guns are out Orange County streets. The Kicks for Guns program offered $50 gift cards in exchange for firearms. Sheriff's Office held the event at the Pine Hills Community Center. Cooler weather in store for us. How long will it stick around? Let's get a check of your Classroom 13 forecast with Central Florida's team of weather experts. We did get to see a lot of sunshine to kick off our work week after those early clouds moved out, but temperatures still coming in well below average. And it's going to be another chilly night with overnight lows in the upper 40s to low 50s. And we can't rule out a coastal shower as that wind switches more onshore. And as we look at what's ahead for the rest of the week, spring has begun. Temperatures are going to be warming back up pretty quickly, already in the 80s by Wednesday. 90 degree temperatures are expected later this week. Prosecutors will not charge a teenager accused in a deadly shooting outside of Orlando High School. 19-year-old Jermaine Brown was killed and three others were hurt outside of Jones High School football game in November. Orlando police arrested a 17-year-old suspect, but State Attorney Monique Worrell says her office can't charge him because they won't be able to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt, saying there's no physical evidence tying the suspect to the case and that they only have testimony from one eyewitness whose statements contradicted themselves and changed over time. Morrell says she hopes Orlando police will continue to investigate the case in search of conclusive evidence. City leaders passed major safety changes for Orlando bars and nightclubs. They will be required to obtain a permit to be able to sell alcohol after midnight. That permit will cost $250 and is required starting on May 1st. On top of that, any bar that wants to remain open until 2 a.m. on the weekends and has 125 or more customers is responsible for hiring one to two officers per night, which costs $99 an hour each. Commissioner Tony Ortiz took issue with the way they decided how much each bar would contribute to the safety measures. Those of you that don't know me, I used to be an accountant <laughs> and a police officer on top of that. So, and I, I'm not, a, I'm not very fond of, of uh, bars and clubs. I'd, li I'd rather see restaurants, cafes, and retail. Yeah. But we need to be ethical and transparent. There is also a moratorium on new bars and nightclubs for six months with the ability to extend it to a year if needed. The efforts to make downtown Orlando more safe stem in part from last summer's shooting near the Wall Street Plaza area. Seven people were injured after police say a fight broke out here just after two in the morning. Orlando police say they identified several people affiliated with gangs who they believed may have been involved. While investigators have recovered a gun they believe was used in the shooting, they have not identified the shooter. 
Law enforcement is trying to get more guns off of our streets. The Orange County Sheriff's Office held an event called Guns for Kicks, offering $50 gift cards in exchange for firearms, no questions asked. Spectrum News reporter John Salazar has a story. The main purpose of the buyback program is to keep the public safe. And so all day long, the mission is proving to be a success. You guys are staying pretty busy this morning. I'm yeah. seeing a lot of weapons come in already. Yeah, we've been uh, receiving a good amount of weapons so far. We're talking potential threats to public safety taken off of city streets, bought back by the Orange County Sheriff's Office. What's the make? It is a Glenfield with one end. And what is the battle? 10. Every year, Orange County officials hold a gun buyback program. The hope is to purchase as many unwanted or unneeded guns as possible. Deputy Felix Cadavia explains why. Uh, the main mission that we have obviously is to reduce crime here in Orange County. And uh, one way to reduce that crime is to take guns off the streets. All set. People who turned in weapons do so anonymously, no questions asked. In return, people get a $50 gift card. Most weapons brought in check out okay. Others have a known history, like this 357 Magnum. The 357 Magnum, well, one of the, that that come that weapon came out um, stolen. With that being said, that won't be used in a commission of a crime, and we can take that off the system. Nearly 50 guns were collected at last year's event. For the deputy and county officials, every gun laying out on this table proves success of the annual program. That's the biggest uh, reason why we're here, and that is our mission is to try to keep people safe. And while the buyback program only lasted a day, Orange County officials say that if you have a weapon and you want to turn it in, you can still do that. The only catch is that there is no gift card. There's no money involved in turning in that weapon. In Orange County, John Salazar, Spectrum News 13. The number of guns this event has taken off the streets has been decreasing in recent years. Numbers from the Orange County Sheriff's Office, they show that they collected 46 firearms in 2022. They don't have numbers from 2021 and 2020. That is because the pandemic altered their plans. In 2019, 85 guns were taken off the streets and in 2018, 116. Other agencies across Central Florida held their own gun take back events. The Osceola County Sheriff's Office hosted gas for guns. Those who exchanged guns at Osceola Heritage Park received $50 gas cards. It's all done as a partnership with Crimeline. Next week, community leaders will hold a panel discussion on the epidemic of teenage violence. The Tiger Bay Club of Central Florida says State Attorney Monique Worrell, Orange County Sheriff John Mina, and Florida Juvenile Justice Association Director Christian Minor have agreed to take part. The club says the context for this event is a recent mass shooting in Pine Hills that left three people dead, including nine-year-old Tiana Major, and News 13 reporter Dylan Lyons, as well as Natasha Augustine. Well, the suspect is facing several murder and attempted murder charges. Apartments in the U.S. are shrinking. According to a report from rentcafe.com, the average size of a new apartment in 2022 was less than 900 square feet. It's about 50 square feet smaller than the average apartment a decade ago. The drop in size is attributed to new construction with more studios and one bedroom units. You might think the smallest apartments are in New York City, but according to the report, the tiniest apartments are actually in Seattle, where the average apartment size is less than 700 square feet. If you're looking for a larger space, you can find that in the capital of Florida. The report says the average apartment size in Tallahassee is 1,100 square feet. We are monitoring another busy week in Tallahassee. The full Senate won't come back together until midweek, but subcommittees are already discussing bills. In the House Ways and Means Committee, House Bill 627 looks to remove local government's authority from passing rent control laws. The bill also adds several tax incentives to land and affordable housing developments. And the Senate Health Policy Subcommittee. Well, senators there are talking about Senate Bill 300, the proposed six-week abortion ban. It provides some exceptions to victims of rape or incest. Several of the country's top Republicans are in Central Florida this week. What they have to say about former President Donald Trump, who thinks he's going to be jailed while he runs for office. Keep it here.
Welcome back to your Weather on the Ones. I'm meteorologist Mallory Nichols. I want to start first with this time lapse. Early this morning, we did have those light showers, some clouds around, but they cleared out quickly. And a lot of our day looked like this. Our camera in Sanford, nothing but blue sky, plenty of sunshine all day long. And we are going to get to see a lot of that sun the rest of the week as temperatures quickly warm back up. Still on the cooler side today, our average temperature this time of year is typically around 79 degrees, but we only made it into the upper 60s, so about 10 degrees below average. That's not going to be the case tomorrow. We're going to be exactly where we should be for Tuesday afternoon and then climb back above average on Wednesday where we'll stay the rest of the week. So heading off to the bus stop tomorrow at 8 o'clock, you might need that light jacket. We do have temperatures that will be around 50 degrees, plenty of sunshine in the morning, a few clouds moving through from time to time for the afternoon, and we can't rule out a coastal shower, but most will stay dry dry as temperatures make it into the mid to upper 70s. So look at our future cast here. We have high pressure that's moving in, but it is going to pick up this onshore wind and with some moisture that's sitting just off to the east of us, a few of these showers may be able to move inland along the east coast as we head towards sunrise and that chance is going to stick around heading into our Tuesday afternoon. Inland areas will stay dry, just maybe a passing cloud or two, but there could be that quick moving shower up and down the east coast. That's about it for rainfall this week. It looks like rain chances will be low at least for the next several days and then a chance will come back to the forecast this weekend. So mostly clear and chilly overnight. Temperatures dropping down into the upper 40s to low 50s. Quickly warming into the mid to upper 70s for our Tuesday afternoon. Can't rule out that coastal shower but most will stay quiet throughout the day. And a look ahead to this weekend. Check out those temperatures around 90 degrees for Saturday. Saturday and Sunday. A bridge that was damaged in a crash last month is forcing Florida's Department of Transportation to make repairs overnight this week. The department plans to close the Southwest 66th Street Bridge over I-75 in Marion County through this Thursday. Here's some video of work that went on last week. As you may remember, a vehicle carrying an oversized load damaged the bridge last month. Drivers were being told should use a Southwest 43rd Street Road Bridge to get around instead. The closures are happening between 7 p.m. and 6 a.m. Now until Thursday, the I-4 East ramp to northbound 429 will be blocked overnight in Osceola County. In Orange County, you can expect a lane of I-4 East to be closed nightly for the rest of the month. From State Road 535 to Central Florida Parkway, you can expect the state Road 417 northbound ramps to I-4 West and East to be blocked overnight until Thursday in Seminole County. Before you travel, check the traffic and transit section of MyNews13.com for an update on where delays are where you're headed. You can also reach out to Jerry Hume and let him know if there's a road issue that causes problems for you. If you have a spring break road trip planned, here's a look at what gas prices are looking like. According to AAA, the state and national average is around $3.45 for regular grade. The Orlando area is around that price at $3.46. Near Daytona Beach, $3.46 as well. And around Melbourne, $3.44 a gallon. Destination Space, Relativity Space, hopes the third time is a charm. They are preparing for another launch attempt of their 3D printed rocket this week. Company leaders scrubbed a pair of launch attempts last week after multiple delays. According to Relativity Space, the three hour launch window will open at 10 on Wednesday night. This would be the first 3D printed rocket sent into orbit. As always, you can count on us to bring you live coverage of it when it happens. Take a look at this impressive light show over Northern California. Blazing chunks of communications equipment at 17,000 miles per hour. 700 pound communications antennas went into space in 2009. Then in February of 2020, the International Space Station discarded the equipment. The debris orbited the Earth for a couple of years and finally got low enough to break apart and burn up. Boeing delivered the most powerful satellite platform the company has built to date. The Viasat 3 Americas was just flown to the Space Coast. It will be the first of three to make up a constellation of others that will provide broadband connectivity. 
The satellite has some of the most largest reflectors ever sent to space. It will be significantly larger than most geostationary satellites. NASA is ending a 15-year mission studying clouds at the edge of space because of battery issues. A spacecraft called AIM is no longer supporting operations. The continuing decline in battery power has now left it unable to receive commands or collect data. AIM actually completed its original mission in 2009, but it was able to extend operations for several more years. A stark new warning from the United Nations says, quote, humanity is on thin ice and that ice is melting fast. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says preventing more damage to the earth would require slashing carbon pollution and fossil fuel use 60% by 2035. The United Nations chief is also calling for an end to new fossil fuel exploration and wants to stop coal, oil and gas use by 2040. Scientists expect this to be the last warning about keeping global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Currently, the world is only a few tenths of a degree away from that globally accepted limit. There is a new twist in the high-profile Murdoch family drama. The family of a teenager found dead along the South Carolina road. They have hired new representation to find out exactly how their son died. 19-year-old Stephen Smith's death in 2015, it was initially ruled as a hit and run. But investigators say they found no injuries or road damage, so his body is being exhumed for an autopsy. We're helping an investigation, and what we're really trying to do is give a mother answers. Parents should never have to witness children dying before them. Now, according to a Highway Patrol report, the Murdow name was mentioned multiple times while investigating the death. State authorities reopened the probe into Smith's death while investigating the murders of Maggie and Paul Murdow. Buster Murdow released a statement saying in part, and I quote, the baseless rumors of my involvement with Stephen and his death are false. Melbourne water customers may soon be seeing a bump in their water bills. We need clean water. It's a necessity. Coming up, we're looking into how much the Harbor City is considering raising water rates and wastewater prices. Keep it here. Spectrum News 13 is brought to you by Fields BMW. Stop by and experience the BMW X5 and X7 today. Here are your winning lottery numbers. 